You're listening to the Complete Human Podcast, hosted by co-founders Jana Breslin and Evan DeMarco. We share authentic conversations about wellness, longevity, personal growth, and bio-optimization, along with inspiring stories that encourage community and social responsibility. We hope you enjoy this episode. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of the Complete Human Podcast with your hosts, Jana Roslin and Evan DeMarco. Uh, we are, I don't know if you've been any more excited for a guest on, on the show. <laughs> uh, we were driving here to the CrossFit Ranch with Dave Castro, and first you said you were nervous, then I think you said you had to pee. <laughs> It's, it's exciting times, it you've is. You've been fangirling for about two days now. You know, I, well, mostly because I, I started across like two and a half years ago or something, and it's just been really transformative for my life. So this is just something I'm personally passionate about, and I'm really excited. So, so 20 years ago, uh, the CrossFit gym started in Santa Cruz uh, as one gym. And since then, I think compliments of it high intensity interval training mixed with Olympic, you know, really kind of yielding some results. It's developed this really impressive, if not fanatical following. Yeah. Um, in 2007, <laughs> <He knows. laughs> uh, in 2007, the first CrossFit Games was held right here in Aromas, California at your family's ranch. Yep. And I think since then, about 2007, you've been a predominant player in the CrossFit community. Um, probably saying, I think one could say probably one of its most notable faces. Mm -hmm. um, and so for those of us who don't know, uh, we've got Dave Castro in his house, not in our house. Um, <laughs> so for those of our followers who don't know who you are, give us a little bit of background on, on Dave Castro. So I started working for CrossFit in 2006. And uh, the reason I even got my foot in the door and had an opportunity to work for CrossFit is uh, I was in the Navy. And I graduated from high school in 1996. I was living here in this, uh, at the ranch. So I started um, researching and reading and buying all the books I could find on Navy SEALs. And, uh, and one common theme, theme I kept uh, coming back to when I studied them was that they had the toughest training in the military. And it was regarded as one of the toughest um, programs to go into. So as I was reading all of this and learning more and more about them, I thought to myself, can I do that? I wondered if I could, if I had what it took to do that. And in high school, I was not, I, I played a lot of sports. I was not an impressive athlete by any stretch of the imagination. I was on the football team um, throughout my entire duration in high school. I never started, I started one game and then I was back on the bench. And uh, I tried out for the wrestling team, didn't like that. Tried out for the basketball team, didn't get picked for the team. So like I didn't excel in athletics at all. And yet here I was thinking, okay, I didn't, I didn't have a great high school career in athletics. I wonder if I have what it takes mentally to do this. And so I kind of thought, um, I want to drop out of college and give it a go. My parents said, no way, don't do that. Go to college. You said you'd go to college. That was your plan. Please give that a chance. And I said, okay. So I went to college. Two months into it, I said, if I don't do this now, I'm never going to do this. If I don't try now, I might graduate college in four years and you know have a completely different life, have a completely different situation, and uh, not want to do this. And I'll regret never have had tried or never have been had actually uh, given an, an attempt. So I dropped out of college and I said I'm going to do this. And I enlisted in the Navy. And um, when you go to boot camp you tell them you want to be a SEAL, and especially at that time, everybody laughs at you, and especially at me, because I'm not an imposing figure. I'm a small guy, smaller, and um, you tell them in boot camp you want to be a SEAL, you go through the, the uh, tests that you have to do, and then from there you go to another school, a vocational school, do the same thing, tell them you want to be a SEAL. If you pass the tests at both of these stages, they send you to San Diego to Coronado, um, which is boot camp, I'm sorry, BUDS, Basic Underwater Demolition SEAL Training. And that's where you go to uh, become a SEAL. So from the point I decided to about a year and a half later, I graduated BUDS in 1998. And from there, I was sent off to the East Coast, East Coast SEAL teams. I spent about eight and a half years there. And then come full circle, I came back to San Diego in about 2000, and actually first before San Diego, I came here. So there's a, there's a, um, call, um, a schoolhouse called the DLI, Defense Language Institute, and it's in Monterey. And there, it's where you learn, Doug, she's exploring. It's where you learn- um, You don't have to buy me a drink next time. <laughs> <laughs> it's where you learn languages. And so while I was stationed at the Defense Language Institute, 
I was living here at the ranch. I was going to school in Monterey, and this was in 2006. At the time, I'd been doing CrossFit for about one year. And I knew the, the main gym and the uh, headquarters was in Santa Cruz. So I started commuting from here. From Monterey, I'd go to Monterey for school, I'd come back, and then I'd go to Santa Cruz, and I'd work out with them. And that's how I met Greg, and Greg, Greg Glassman, the founder. And he was very accommodating and uh, very generous to the military, to military folks. And so he, he let me train there for free. He kind of took me under his wing. He let me, um, he let me go to a seminar for free. And then he asked if I wanted to start helping out at seminars. So I started um, volunteering, essentially, at some of the level one seminars. And that's how I got my foot in the door with CrossFit. And from there, it was, it was all about, in my eyes, just um, creating value and contributing to the team. And, you know, I came from this That sounds like a very SEAL kind of philosophy. Yeah, it is, but it's easy to come from that SEAL background and come into a civilian environment and think you have so much to offer without actually wanting to offer much. Yeah, now it's, if this is your life. Like you, yeah. it is CrossFit all well, the way. So in that phase, so that was around 2006, um, I was still active duty. And, and I, from the beginning, I talked to uh, the media team and I said, don't talk about me being a SEAL. Don't put it out there. Don't, I don't want to lead with the fact that I'm a Navy SEAL and I don't want you guys to leverage that either. And that, even to this day, is pretty important to me. Like when you look at my social media or how I handle myself publicly, I don't lean on that. Mm -hmm. And I'm really proud of that because um, I really respect what I did and the people I served with and the people I work with. And one of the things that made us who we are is this notion of being a silent professional. It was 12 years in, in 2010, I decided I wanted to get out and work full time for CrossFit because something had to give. I couldn't do both any longer. If I stayed in the Navy, I'd go back to being operational. And if when you're operational, you uh, I would have a chaotic schedule and I wouldn't be able to do the work I was doing for CrossFit. And I had some loose ends I wanted to kind of tie up, tie up. And one of those was deploying again. So I called one of my old team leaders at one of my former teams and I said, hey, can I deploy with you guys to Afghanistan? Um, and I didn't tell him at the time I was getting out yet. I didn't tell anybody. And he said, sure. And so I deployed to Afghanistan and uh, was doing combat missions while programming the CrossFit Games and planning the CrossFit <laughs> Games and uh, scheduling and staffing level one seminars. Wow. So I was working, I would come back from missions and we, we had hacked uh, Wi-Fi or, or internet and uh, doing both jobs. And that's something that's not like, I, again, it's one of those things I, I rarely talk about and haven't like led or pushed out, pushed that narrative out, but it is a cool little fact. Mm -hmm. So in 2010, um, that's when I completely cut ties with the military and was full-time CrossFit. Well, yeah. first of all, thank you for your service. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. And um, you you mentioned social media. So I've, I've seen a few things floating around on social media and I have to ask, why is Dave Castro a prick? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is that about? Actually, that goes back to the SEAL team days. So okay. yeah, in two, from 2007 to 6, 7 to 10, when, when I was in San Diego, I was a buds instructor. And um, I taught uh, shooting and close quarter combat tactics at the final phase of, of that program. And what that means is, you know, the first few phases in BUDS, you're trying to get people to quit, you're being an asshole, and you're trying to flush people out. By the time they got to me, we're trying to now develop in them into becoming SEALs, and um, you are judging them for different things. You're judging them for their critical thinking and their ability to make decisions at a split second, the right decision. And so in that, I held people to really high standards, and I was kind of, uh, I was kind of a prick. I was a, a tough instructor, but not in the traditional sense, the ways that you see, the way you see people in the documentaries or in the movies, but in a different, in a, in a more mental way. And so a, the students created a sticker that said, Dave Castro is a prick. And uh, <laughs> it circulated all around San Diego, and you'd go into SEAL bars, and you'd see it, and actually all across the country, there were locations where we do a lot of training and the sticker would just pop up everywhere. Mm -hmm. So years later, Josh Bridges, who's, a, who's from San Diego and he's a big name CrossFit competitor, former SEAL, I put him through training. He said, hey Dave, do you mind if uh, Rich, Dan and I make a t-shirt and sell it that says Dave Castro is a prick, that same sticker. So and kind I, that he asked first. Though. Yeah, he was so <laughs> kind. And he actually said some of the money will go to your charity of choice. And so I said, sure, let's do it. Well, he did it, and that shirt became like a huge hit, and uh, 
that year we were running regionals and every event I went to, people want to take a picture of me that were wearing this shirt. And it, it was a very, it's a very popular shirt in the community. <laughs> but I, I, uh, I like it. People thought I'd be upset by it or insulted, it, whatever. There, obviously there's been a lot going on with CrossFit lately. And I think a lot of it stems from the recent stuff that has come up um, with Greg Glassman and his mm -hmm. tweet. Um, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about what was said? And you know, it's been a wild few weeks. Few. Uh, well, it's been about a month now. Yeah. Um, it's tragic to see how things have played out, and just think like, um, you know, that tweet, that moment doesn't define that man to me. Mm -hmm. He's done so much for the world, and done so much for me personally and done so much for, for society and fitness that, um, and here's the thing, I know he's not racist either, and that wasn't the intent behind it. So it's been, you know, this interesting struggle of just like, um, wow, you can make a mistake. I don't, say, I don't even want to call it, a, you can, one wrong action and it can all come down. And that's just like a big wow, like I see how it happened to him and like that could happen to any of us, you know, and just like it just really taught me um, to really be aware of anything and everything I say. So I, that's an interesting thing that you bring up, right? And, and I guess my question on that, and, and we don't really want to get too far into this. I think that there's so many other positive things in CrossFit that we can talk about. But it seemed that there was a really delayed response from the tweet from corporate. Mm -hmm. And my question is, would it have been better for him and for the community for him to just, you know, the very next day say, you know what, that was, I, I screwed up, I'm sorry. Um, it, it seemed like he kind of doubled down on it. And, and I think the question that I've seen in the CrossFit community was, was that systemic from the fact that he owned 100% of the company? Mm -hmm. And did he really have like a board of directors or any accountability to a corporate environment where they could have said, hey, you need to either, you know, apologize right now or we have to oust you? It, it just seemed like there was a really delayed he ended response. Up, he did end up apologizing. And I don't think that got, you know, because it doesn't suit the narrative that everybody wanted, but it didn't get run, it didn't get shared, it didn't get a lot of, uh, it didn't get a lot of distribution because the, we'll say the damage is already done. Within the next 24 hours, I think there was an apology, and he, it was a very long apology that he wrote. But at that point, you know, it kind of didn't matter. It kind of like the damage was done and people were gonna go forward um, with demanding what they wanted and keep pushing that he could have, I mean, he could have kept apologizing. He could have apologized. The apology never would have been enough. And that was and, an interesting feedback. Like you saw it, right? Because it was, it was like an explosion. Like, well, wait a sec. How does this community of 15,000 gyms globally have such a visceral response to one person? It's like, that's a community. You know, like, it, it was a really interesting the, dynamic. Uh, the, the other thing that is, an, I, will, I will say this, having been on the inside when all this was going down, it wasn't like 15,000 affiliates were leaving us. And what I mean by that is there was a lot of noise and especially after he stepped down and put me into the position, um, there were, we were getting a ton of support. Like we had a lot of affiliates who were emailing us and saying, hey, we're, we're on your side, we're looking forward to the future, we trust you guys. The problem is, uh, to use the phrase, the uh, vocal minority, you, you don't see that. And a lot of them were afraid to say anything or afraid to publicize that. So I felt during that time, there was only one audible side talking and um, it frankly from what I saw internally in the emails we were getting and the support we were getting it was definitely one side of the story we there was not a there was not a point in all of this where we we're gonna lose 15,000 affiliates or, or I didn't say even 5,000 and even to this to this point we probably lost three or four hundred I definitely saw a lot of the you know the sides that were you know a lot of people were upset but also a lot of people were very supportive I think I saw you post a lot of um, stories and stuff people saying you know all in like we're all yeah. in we're you know keeping our affiliate name and moving forward you know strong with CrossFit so and I felt like I had to do that because I don't think that was happening and even the people who were doing that they have a small reach so I felt like okay like I can use my bigger reach to try to amplify that hey there is a lot of positivity here because the the biggest voices in our community at this point were are the athletes in terms of following they have the most followers I don't think they're the most significant voice. I think that's our affiliates, but they have the most followers. So they were the easy ones to, like a lot of people saw, got reposted, their perspective. And um, that's why once 
we were making changes and going in a more positive direction. Those that were supporting us, I tried reposting their stuff in my story and showing support and showing really that was about showing there's two sides to this story. And so the new the new CEO is Eric Rosa. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm curious what the management structure looks like moving forward um, with him coming in now. Does anything change? As far as I yeah, a lot's changing. <laughs> we uh, we're going to Boulder tomorrow, and uh, there's a handful of people. There's um, a bunch of different meetings, and. Uh, It'll be the first time we have meetings with essentially the new leadership team, but at this point there's not many people from the original team on the new team. Um, it's a smaller group, it's more of his people and a few of us. Um, so it's going to look very different. There were a lot of other people who were looking at buying CrossFit and they were not CrossFitters and they were not Eric Rosa. And they, it would be very different if some of these other groups ended up having bought CrossFit because they didn't have CrossFit, or CrossFit in the, their blood, and Rosa does. So we are, I think, frankly, very lucky that it's him who's buying this, and we're in a really good position. I'm, I'm excited about it and the future with him. So to that extent, are you still the acting CEO of CrossFit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I laugh about that, um, but yes, I am. So, I mean, you know, Jen and I are very familiar with mergers and acquisitions, having, you know, just gone through a couple ourselves. Yes. And, and we know that deals can blow up at the 11th hour or, or the 11th and a half hour. So is there any contingency in the event that maybe the due diligence doesn't work out, you know, anything like that? Well, um, it's going to be fine. It's going to work out. <laughs> It's going to work out. I love it. All right. So, so, so those interested in the CrossFit IPO, yeah, that's, um, I, I think the other question that we've seen a lot in social media is, is Glassman going to have any continued ownership or involvement within the, within the community? No. Ownership, no. And involvement um, at this stage, no. At this time, no. You know, to be honest, I'd like to see a, a time when he could come back and contribute because, you know, he he has an amazing mind and amazing an ability to create and create things for health and fitness that um, is is un, um, no one else can do it like he can and so i think to lose that completely would be a shame maybe there'll be a point when the community is uh, willing to accept him back and let him contribute in in any way he can um, I wanted to bring up something that I heard in a previous podcast that um, you mentioned that you, you felt hurt by the community because you weren't recognized as Mexican American and you know there was some talk that there wasn't enough diversity within CrossFit and I mean I'd love for you to elaborate more on that and yeah I, like so after all this stuff went down one of you know even after so after after the George Floyd stuff and after later than the tweet well even before the tweet so many people were telling me I had to put up a, you know, say this or put up this black image. And I was getting attacked from all angles outside of, not within the company, but outside. Do this or do that or say this. And if you're not doing this or you're not doing that, or you're not saying this, you're part of the problem or you're racist. And I was getting DMs of people saying this stuff. I was getting it on my account. And it was so disturbing to me because I'm A, Mexican American. And uh, B, all my actions, you know, I've never, I've never, I've never been racist and I've never shown the world that I'm racist, so why now do I have to do whatever, why do I have to do the popular thing at the time to uh, pacify some people, to pacify someone else's interest? Why are you going to tell me what to do and if I don't do that, I'm a bad person? And you know, when I was growing up here, I uh, went to Watsonville High and Watsonville High probably had 90% Mexican population. I was on the football team and it was a lot of white kids and Mexican kids on the football team. And when I hung out with, uh, my white friends, I was really Mexican. And when I hung out with my Mexican friends, I wasn't Mexican at all. Mm -hmm. And so like, especially because I didn't speak Spanish. So when I think about why this was bothering me so much at this period, I go back to that phase where like, at times I'm not brown enough, at other times I'm too brown. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then when I was in the SEAL teams, you know, I was, there's not many uh, ethnic people at all in the SEAL teams. And, and I don't blame that on, on them being non, inclusive or anything by their design it's just the way it shakes out uh, it shook out um, so even there in that environment you know I had nicknames like brown guy <laughs> and you know uh, stuff like that and it was fine to me and I laughed about it it doesn't bother me it was okay um, it is frustrating I mean it's like at what point do does a company or do figures within a company 
have the ability or the right to kind of push back on the you know customers or the community for for stuff like this. I mean, it's like what what is the limit there? And it, I think that is a struggle for for yeah. a lot of people. Right now is a, a tricky time with all of this. The the cancel culture or that aspect is kind of winning. I mean, look, the Washington Redskins had to change their name, right. and uh, and before they changed their name, you had you had. Um, Nike and all these brands pulling their stuff off the shelf. So they force these companies and people into a position where they have no choice but to make action or to take action. Tearing down statues of historical figures, all of it, it's wild. It is wild. Yeah, it's, it's a different world than I think we grew up in. And you and I graduated uh, high school at the same year, so I'm assuming we're about the same age. But it's, uh, you know, I've never seen anything like this yeah. in that count, the, the cancel culture. Just social media has given people a voice, and that's great. But I've always said that, you know, freedom of speech is advanced citizenship where you should be responsible for what it is you're saying. Yeah. Recognize like, okay, it was one man, it was one tweet, could have been com taken completely out of context, you know? And, and again, I'm not here to, to speak for Glassman, but yeah. you know, we're in a position where we're talking to you as the CEO of a company because of one thing that was said. Yeah. Um, now, I do think that that brings up one other element that we want to discuss, which is there has been a lot of there's been a lot of focus on the CrossFit corporate environment, and you know I think that there's been a lot of things that said about Greg, about you know a lot of sexual harassment. So I don't want to get into that and really spend a lot of time, but we do want to at least address it from the standpoint of you know what are your thoughts on this? What was really the culture from the inside versus you know some some random person saying they were there at a at an event ten years ago? Well, and that was one of the problems with all of this is you look at the time frame for what most of that stuff is being said and the stories they were most like it was you know, a very, very long time ago. And interestingly, I believe there is a lot of good people and a lot of positive culture within our company, and there has been. And it's the hard part that what people don't see is um, we're broken up into so many little different groups and so many different little uh, areas of, of, you know, teams, and we're mostly virtual. And we do have an HQ, we do have an office in Scotts Valley, um, at its peak, it probably had 60 or 70 people there, and right now it has 30, maybe 25, 30. But, you know, Greg, Greg ran in his own little um, clique, his own environment, did his own thing, and he didn't really interact with, with everyone else. And sometimes I was with him, and most of the times I was with him, or almost all the times I was with him, some of the stuff that's being said, I had no idea about, or I've never seen. And um, I'm not saying that doesn't make it, um, I'm not trying to, to uh, say that um, those stories are complete lies or they're truth. I can't verify. Yeah. But um, there were a lot of good pockets and areas and people within our culture. And I feel really, uh, I'm upset that none of that was highlighted and all that was talked about. Again, it's like all that was talked about was this negativity and this old negativity, but it's, uh, and I'm biased because even, so I admit like, yeah, I was a senior leader. I've been a senior leader in CrossFit for the last 14, 15 years. So of course I'm going to say, um, I think of course people, people are going to expect me to say this, but I really do believe it. Like I believe I was a really good leader and I believe we had other really good leaders who had a lot of good people working for them and uh, and a lot of those people and, and areas didn't did not intersect with Greg it's not like Greg ran this company and just worked like just was all around in all the departments and everyone fed off his energy and everyone uh, took his cues that's that's not the case uh, largely because we we're virtual so uh, when I lived in San Diego Greg lived in San Diego for a time then Greg lived in Hawaii then Greg lived in Santa Cruz. Then Greg lived in Portland. And so, like, he's been all over the map. And they're even up, in, up until this event, just for me personally, up until um, all this stuff went down, it, would, it had been about a month and a half before I had even hung out or talked to him. And so, like, that stuff, there's other phases where we'd hang out every day for weeks on end. And then there's phases where we wouldn't talk for a couple months. And in those phases, I'm just doing my work and putting my head down. So, um, I think it was... Personally, I think it was a lot, um, but I, I can't speak for individuals either. So that being said, individual stories or stuff that happened to individual people, I'm not discrediting them or I'm not saying their circumstance or what they experienced didn't happen because maybe it did, but, and I didn't see it. 
so that's that's the truth, uh, how I feel about it. And uh, and again, I'm going to take it to this place of, you know, I feel like no one's focusing on again on all the good people we have and all the good we did, and even the athletes jumping on board all this stuff. Like I was upset because. I think of all the events we've done with them and all the places we've taken them and all the opportunities we've provided for them to excel and we've treated people, them especially, very well. And we do events whenever we do open announcements or invitationals or even at regionals and other events. You know, we have we have people assigned to them to make sure they're taken care of and they're not they were treated very fairly. So to see so much of this like okay he's bad now all of you are bad and everyone's bad and everyone needs to go and the whole leadership team needs to be taken out uh i thought it was unfair it's a chance. well yeah. i was just about to say it seemed like or just from what i could tell or read that you know from people in within cross that they were leaving but i've also heard of people coming back to with the changes that have been made mm -hmm. so it sounds like yeah. there's a lot of optimism moving forward and i love for you yeah. to touch on that too is what does the future of cross look like i think uh I think it's very bright. I think it's going to be very different, and I also think that's okay. I think there's people who are going to struggle with change internally in the company and externally, and I think that's part of big change. And uh, it would be it would be um, ridiculous if Eric didn't have big visions and big plans to change all of this. Of course he does. You know, he's uh, he's a new owner with a different background, and uh, and he's going to do things differently, and that's fine. And I embrace it, and I'm excited. I'm excited to see where he takes it. Am I going to challenge him? Yeah. Am I going to try to, there's some stuff that I think should be preserved and not um, abandoned for sure. It'll be challenging. There'll be some bumps in the road, but uh, hopefully I'll last. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are some of the things that you really wanted to accomplish as CEO that you may or may not have had a chance to, or, or maybe even have the potential to work on moving forward? Well, right away. So we, there was a lot of things we could do quickly um, that, so very on, when I was named C, very, very early on, I knew the sale thing was also happening because it was, there was a time before um, it was, an, even when it was announced, there was a few weeks pre that, that we knew this was in motion. So did you know that your role as CEO was gonna be kind of short-lived? Not right away, okay. <laughs> but like maybe a week later or so, like yeah. I, I, the ball was in motion with some of these discussions. Gotcha. And, uh, but I couldn't let that, slow me down or prevent me from doing things or making chain changes and there was a lot of little things so knowing that there was a lot of little and immediate things that I wanted to do and and change I wanted to make um, that I don't want to say was low-hanging fruit but that was low impactful that wasn't like major changes to the whole company and the whole affiliate program some of those things that we did uh, well one of the basic things was just increasing communication so we don't speak to our affiliates that much, and that was one of the biggest concerns and areas of improvement that they recommended, was we want to hear from you guys more, and we want to hear directly from you, not from some of the other media outlets. So right away, we started communicating, and communicating looked like sending emails out to the affiliates on a regular basis. So now we have a weekly email that goes out to them, and in between that, if we have anything else to say, we'll say it midweek. And, and that sounds silly, but understand, for us, that's huge because Greg was always against sending out emails to our affiliates. He just, he, he really has this uh, hands off approach and you know, don't bother them. They're going to do their own thing. And some people frankly do want to be bothered, <laughs> not bothered, but they want to hear from us. And so we, we increase the communication tempo. I've had some affiliates email me and say, Hey, since you've been in, we've heard from you guys more in the last week than we have in the last five years. And so that was an easy thing to, to help. And on in an, and in all that communication, we're facilitating, hey, talk back. We're facilitating communication. Like, tell us what you want to hear. Tell us what you want to see from us. So with all this stuff going on, people were demanding, you guys need to you know, give money to this cause or say this or do this. And uh, I was thinking, how can we contribute and make a difference and not just make it about money or giving money to any one. And so I was talking to one of our trainers and it hit me. I said, hey, we're going to do what we do. And he says, what do you mean? I go, well, what do we do? And he goes, I don't know. <laughs> you know we're trainers <laughs> and we teach level one courses. We teach, we give people the skills to, uh, to change people's lives. We teach them how to fish essentially so they can put, uh, you know, uh, food on their table, but through training and through coaching. I said, so we're going to go into areas that typically don't have the, um, 
financial means or accessibility to a CrossFit Level 1 seminar, and we're going to give CrossFit Level 1 seminars to some of these communities. And so we set one up. The first one we did was in Atlanta, and I said it, I wanted it to be for youth and young adults in those areas, and again, people who would never really have the opportunity to, to do our program. And so we reach out to uh, local community centers and local community reps, not CrossFit, but just in, the, uh, in those areas. And the first one we did was this past weekend, and it was a seminar, there's about eight children. They were ranged from 15 to, actually there's a young, there's a 19 year old too. And um, they had only done CrossFit two or three times, and we put them through a level one seminar. And so we're giving these kids, these young adults, tools and a skill set for the future if they so choose to want to go down this path of being a trainer. And it's, I, I love the fact that you say this, right? And, and I wanted to ask the question because it needed to be asked, but is this really just another witch hunt? Like, it's, it doesn't seem like you're hand-selecting people to get to the games. There's, you have to go through a process to get there. It's a very fair and mathematical process that, like, the fittest, we're testing for the fittest man or woman alive. And based off of, you know, CrossFit's definition of fitness, that's how we find who gets to that level. At no point in that, does your skin color have anything to do with it? Arguably, it's the most inclusive sport out there. We've had 450,000 people around the world at its peak enter this um, program called the CrossFit Open and, and play in this sport. And you know what, for those 450,000 people, about 50% are US, even at that stage, and the rest are international. And we don't have a look at what everyone looks, we don't have a view of what all those people look like. But if you were to take a, if, you were, if we were able to capture a photo for every one of those, it would look incredibly diverse. And that's, that's the field. It's not the 30 or 40 or 150 that go to the games, it's there, that's where it starts. I do have to say, I, I started CrossFit a month before my first Open. <laughs> and so that was quite an experience, but I mean, that's, just speaking personally, that was my first experience really was how inclusive CrossFit is. And it's like, anyone can walk into a gym. Yeah. Everyone is accepted. I've never made so many friends with the gym ever before, like in my life until yeah. I started doing CrossFit. So I absolutely, I mean, it's, it's super inclusive and yes, I've, I've sure. seen it firsthand. So, so I, w I want to ask the really tough question. Okay. You come up with the games, right? With, you know, crowning the fittest man and woman on the planet. Did that begin over drinks? Because it, it reminds me of so many drunk conversations I've had with friends who are like, who's the best athlete? You know, you're trying to compare like basketball, football, and baseball. Like, was the origins of that really kind of the level playing field that I think so many conversations have been had with guys over the years of like, who's really the best athlete? Is it Michael Jordan? Is it Mike Tyson? You know, anything like that. So no, it was, we, uh, so I worked for, I started working for Greg in 2006, early 2007. I brought him here to show him around the property because he lived in Santa Cruz at the time. And we were walking around here and he goes, oh, this is a great space. Why don't we do an event here? And um, I said, like what? And he said, well, let's do the Woodstock of fitness and basically have a big weekend where we just do a bunch of tests and we find the, the best CrossFitter. So interestingly enough, it started more with this notion of finding the best CrossFitter. And I don't think it was until 2008 or nine where he actually coined, we're titling the fittest man and woman alive in the world and he gets credit for that um i don't think it was definitely yeah it was he was the first to say that and so he he claimed that space that we are titling the fittest man and fittest woman alive and it wasn't at the inception of it in the beginning and it was also you got to understand when we first started this in 2007 we had no idea what it was going to grow into we had no idea how big it was going to get so um i think we really just thought we we're going to have a little gathering <laughs> um, it being a little gathering. Not anymore. So um, speaking of the games, we, we're, st we're still hoping there's a games this year. Yes, we and are. And I'd love yeah. for you to talk about that. I mean, that, this is like one of the most exciting things of, you know, the year for me to watch and be a part of, so. You went two years ago, right? I went last year. Last year, okay. Yeah, um, yeah we're trying to pull it off. It's, there's a lot of struggles and a lot of, it's an uphill battle between, um, especially well almost exclusively because of covid and you know this recent resurgence if you will yeah. and um travel restrictions mm -hmm. so we have a lot of issues we're dealing with but we're still trying to do it uh gavin newsom suspended indoor gyms again so now we're back to this issue where these small independent affiliates who are really kind of owner operated businesses are struggling um is this, what's the long-term potential of CrossFit and can COVID actually, you know, 
caused some major problems. There's a lot of gyms that are having to, uh, that are on the verge or have to close down because of COVID. And at this stage, um, that we need to get through this. And, and I believe some won't get through this. And, but when we do get through this, uh, there's, this isn't going to last forever. There's, there's going to be a period where, yeah, there's going to be a period where we get through this and uh, maybe there's a vaccine or maybe it's just completely gone. And I believe things will return to normal. I know a lot of people don't, but there will be something that we return to that looks more normal than right now. And um, we're going to be fine. CrossFit's going to be fine. And there's going to be a lot of gyms that are going to do well. And there'll be more that there's still an opportunity, an economic opportunity for a small business owner to start up a gym and, and, and do well off of a CrossFit gym and that model that we have. And that will continue to happen after this. So for those, we will lose some, and, and that's a shame. We don't want to see that happen at all. But going forward, there'll be more that we do gain and there'll be different environments and the economic situation won't always be the same and there'll be an opportunity for plenty of others to stand up. And, and commercial real estate's gonna be really cheap here in the next. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. So uh, there's a lot of factors like that, that I, I believe we, and when I say we, I just don't mean CrossFit HQ, I mean the whole ecosystem. We're gonna, we're gonna be fine, and we're gonna, um, we're gonna come out of this stronger, actually. So along those lines, uh, as a result, uh, a little bit of the tweet, maybe it's the economic situation, but as of this year, Reebok has you know, decided not to renew their, their contract. Rogue seems like they've pulled out as a sponsor as a result of this. So what does this do from a financial standpoint to CrossFit, who, based off of the Forbes article in 2015, valued CrossFit at a $4 billion business? Um, you know, where is that at now? I, I and you're to... laughing at that. I'm kind of curious why. Because <laughs> I've done the math on it, and I can't figure out that valuation. Yeah, nor can I. <laughs> and, uh, I'd like to have a drink with that reporter and talk to him about how he got to that. because. I don't want to say that's done more damage, but that's been more misleading than many other things I can think of in CrossFit. Because I've heard that $4 billion number repeated. Hey, look, we're a pretty good company and we, we're, we've, we've, we've had our moments, but we're not a fucking $4 billion company. <laughs> I'm glad you said that because I did the math nine ways from something. I'm like, really? And that like was a reporter having, not ch fact checking or something, um, but. Yeah, it does have Which then brought up the question is, how much money does Eric Rosa have? Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so if you go back, so, okay, so the Reebok thing, to be frank, I don't want to say it was a PR stunt, but like um, our contract was up in this year and we were already kind of, uh, Greg, under Greg, he kind of wanted to go away from them. And so they, they decided we're not going to do anything forward. But this year they're still in and they're still sponsoring the games and they're still giving a cash prize at the games. And like everything, this is why I say it's misleading, because everything for the rest of this year is still the same, which is significant mm -hmm. because they sponsor and they spend a lot of money on the games and from their clothing we get a lot of, um, we get royalty. And so it was really for the next year going forward where the contract already ended anyways. So I say it's misleading because a lot of people hit me up and said, hey, well, Reebok's out, so what are you guys gonna do now? I'm like, they're not really out. They're still here. They're yeah. still going forward with they this honor year. Their contract. Yeah, they're honoring their contract. Um, going forward, I mean, the, the discussions, I think, to negotiate with them if we choose to, the opportunity is still there. And, um, and if we choose to go in a different direction, I think there'll be opportunity there, especially with, uh, with Eric at the helm now and um, companies being excited at the opportunity to, to partner with us. Because here's the thing. The reality is, this is the big player. Like CrossFit is in the position uh, to continue to dominate the fitness scene and the fitness world, and and people recognize that. Regardless of our speed bumps, this will all pass, mm -hmm. and uh, and we're we hold a distinct advantage over in this space over everyone else, and and realizing that is important. And I think um, there's companies who do realize that and and recognize, okay, there is a good still a good future for this going forward. Rogue, they're still in. Um, yeah, they, they're still involved with the games this year too. Same sort of thing. Um, and they'll, they'll more likely be involved in the games going forward uh, more so than even Reebok. So like yeah, the, re the relationship with Rogue is, uh, is stronger than ever. Okay. When Greg put me in as CEO, um, I talked to Bill on a, almost a daily basis and, uh, and he's talked to Eric. We met with Eric. We had a dinner with Eric uh, about a week ago. So. The rogue thing is, is working out fine too.
Rogue <laughs> hasn't gone rogue. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so a lot of athletes have said that they are choosing not to participate. Um, are you are you shocked that you know some of like the biggest names out there that have competed are are really out? I mean, what what's your message to them? Well, they're all back in now at this stage. Uh, so uh, Eric and our team talked to a lot of them and. I think the Eric move was enough for a lot of them to feel comfortable to come back. Mm -hmm. So at this stage, all 30 men and all 30 women that we invited are back in. Interestingly, especially with the way I am, I feel like you say you're out, be out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, stand by what you're going to say. So I'm not too impressed with how a lot of that went down. I wouldn't say anything like that unless I was going to stay, stand by it and, and really stick with it through the end. But um, I think it's ridiculous how many had to speak and felt the need, like, right now to, to go that route. And I was 100% prepared to backfill, and we would have the games. And to me, like, that didn't, I wasn't bothered by it. Mm -hmm. I don't, I was talking about this earlier on Instagram Live. Um, I don't place them on a pedestal like others do, and I don't fanboy over them, and I think that actually is why I'm so effective at, in this position and role, because, you know, they don't, we had a lot of people even in our media who would really look up to these athletes, and, and they do look up to these athletes, and don't get me wrong, what they accomplish is significant, and they're, they're great um, athletes and um, competitors, but if I were to sit here and be like, oh man, so-and-so's not competing, and damn, that's gonna hurt our ratings, and oh, so-and-so is out too, and I like got worried about that, it would make me less effective and actually biased towards certain individuals and athletes. So I kind of have a nice disconnect in my perspective of things from them in terms of their public persona and, um, and, and how, they, how they choose to conduct themselves um, in, in moments like this. So when they do that to me, it's almost not a surprise. Of course they have to do that. It's the popular thing. Of course they have to do it. You know, for them, the, so for me, making the popular decision is not, like for me, I, I pride myself on I make the right decision, not the popular decision. Um, they live in a world almost exclusively where they have to make popular decisions or their sponsors are going to be mad at them or their fans are going to be mad at them. I'm not beholden to any of that. I work for CrossFit and yet yeah, if in the old regime, Greg wanted me to do something, he never did though. If like he never said publicly say this or publicly do this, and I was able to stand my ground and make my decisions based off of again the right thing and not the popular thing. Uh, I don't believe Eric will hold me. I don't think. Uh, I think Eric will give me the same freedom. But those athletes operate in a different world. They operate in again. They have. They have. And you know, I know for a fact some of them felt like they had to do some of that mm -hmm. and say some of those things. Again, why? Because it's the popular thing to do, not necessarily the right thing to do. And that is hard for people to hear and understand, especially young people. Going against the grain is one of the toughest things you will do, but it is so necessary and you'll grow and be stronger from it. Go, not doing what's popular, but what's right, right for you, right for your family, right for your community, that's hard. And that's what I've seen through all of this. It's hard for people to choose the, uh, challenging path or the tough path instead of the easy route it's a so, great message absolutely that kind of got me thinking um you got me thinking about a couple different things there's, there's a couple things i want to unpackage there um as, as it comes to the athletes is crossfit unique because i think of football right like if roger goodell of the nfl had said something similar would there have been the backlash from the athletes you know whoever it is saying i'm not going to play football anymore did, was CrossFit unique in that respect? Because I, I kind of think that other sports wouldn't have had the same level of response. They would have denounced the person who said it, but there wouldn't have been like, well, I'm not going to play football anymore. I think if, at this stage, in this environment, any of those guys, if they would have done something similar, the reaction would have been very similar. Yeah. You know, um, I think some of these guys think they're football players and think they're NBA stars and think they're, you know, <laughs> but they're not uh, at that level. That. That's another topic, but... Um. That, well, hold on, that's my second question. I love that you brought that up, right? Because you guys have effectively found the fittest human beings on the planet. Yes. I mean, so, so my question is, knowing that and recognizing that you've got Reebok, you've got some major you know, brands behind this, why have these athletes not transcended to the same place that some of your you know, baseball, football, 
whatever athletes are. I mean, really just the, I can't think of why Nike wouldn't want a, a full-blown national campaign with the fittest man in the world. Well, they do sponsor Matt. Nike does sponsor the champion, Matt Frazier. I don't think they've done a full-blown full blown campaign, as you're stating. But it's simply um, duration of, of uh, sport in the field. We've only been around for 10 years. And I think what, what's going on, and I challenge our future leadership not to take us in this direction, but like people want this to be more professional and bigger than it is, and as big as sports that have been around for 40, 50, you know, years that have huge foundation under them. The NBA, baseball, uh, NFL, those sports have been around forever. Mm -hmm. And like they didn't get to this point overnight. And same thing with us, there's some patience. We can't force us being a major sport and having all these professional athletes. And I believe in the past, we didn't force that. We let it grow organically and naturally and get to a point where um, society and basically the market decided it was going to get to. We didn't try to force the growth. We let the growth take us. We, we rode the wave of the growth. And that's really important in all of this. And that's what I'm, I'm gonna challenge Eric with. Hey, don't try to make this bigger than it is, faster than it should be. And the athletes definitely want that. The athletes definitely want this to be bigger than it is for their benefit financially. Mm -hmm. then, then sometimes we should uh, attempt to make it. Meaning we can easily overextend ourselves to make it this huge international um, super sport with all these opportunities for all these athletes and then we find ourselves in a compromised position and we're on our heels. And what's that look like? Um, too many events with low viewership, with low attendance, with little interest. So we have to balance, we have to balance the growth of the sport out and not try to force it. Interestingly, the thing that supports all of that and we haven't talked about, well, much in terms of this, is the affiliates. Mm -hmm. And the affiliates, the cross of the 50,000 gyms, are the foundation for all of our success. If they're struggling or if there's issues with them, the rest of it doesn't work. So we, as a company and organization, have to always remember, okay, the athletes and that end of it, the, and here I am, the CrossFit guy, games guy, saying, hey, the games are great, but we need to focus on the base of the pyramid, and that's the affiliates. And, and what happens to the everyday CrossFitter and the average person who goes into a gym? That's really the most significant thing about all of this. And the professional side of it and the elite side should really work to cycle people into the gym. And how do you do that? Through motivating them, through being someone's Michael Jordan, through being someone's you know superstar athlete that they look up to or motivates them to go into the gym. So I'm glad you said that because I think that's the one thing that I have not seen from CrossFit is, is it's interestingly enough the one sport where the average person can participate in it. You know, mm -hmm. you don't see a lot of guys going out and playing, you know, padded football on the weekends. No. Or, you know, so it's and that's also what gives us tremendous potential for the future. Yeah. Because everybody when you go to the CrossFit games, as you've seen, everyone there does CrossFit. So people can relate and connect to what's going on on the floor. They might not use the same weights, they might not use the same, uh, do the same movements, but they understand what they're going through. And in, all, in many cases, there are workouts that pretty much everyone can do at home. Mm -hmm. And they can do the same weights and they can experience it the same way that the people at the games are. And that's what's cool about the CrossFit Open. So the CrossFit Open has um, the best in the world, Matt Frazier, Tia, competing against people like me, like they're not so best in the world. I was, and so like we all compete against each other and we all rank against each other. And it's just this uh, beautiful expression of, of, of CrossFit in that everyone does the same exact thing, same exact test, same exact workout. Let's see with your background, at least you probably know nine ways to kill them with a spoon. <laughs> with a spoon? Yeah. It's, actually, it's actually 10 ways. <laughs> exactly. Um, Go ahead, I think you had a question. No, I was just going to, I mean, any other questions we have? Uh, you know, I want to touch on one thing. I, I, I'm not, I don't have the CrossFit background that you guys do. Um, I kind of get it more from friends, and I think with my travel schedule, my workouts are usually hotel gyms. But a couple things that CrossFit has done that I, I don't know if I'm okay with is made it acceptable for my best friends to call me and say, let me tell you about my wad. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> but uh, joking aside, I, I think the one thing that, I've been in arguments or heated discussions with is, is CrossFit for the everyday person? We hear so much about rhabdo. We hear so much about, you know, some of the, you know, some of the injuries that have come out of CrossFit and that a lot of athletes kind of wear those as badges of honor. So 
Is CrossFit taking a position or do you feel that it is really for the everyday person looking to get in shape? It is absolutely for the everyday person looking I to get in shape. For you. I know <laughs> you did. And interestingly, the injuries you say that they wear as badges, I wouldn't say are injuries. Like when you talk ripped hands, that's not an injury. That's mm -hmm. like, so that's some of the things you see people show off and, 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 peop and people are really critical of that. Like, why are you posting your hands torn on your Instagram or whatever? That just shows how dangerous CrossFit is. But that's not an injury. That's superficial. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are some occupations where tearing your hands probably isn't uh, like a, a, if you're a surgeon or or um, is, isn't a good thing for for you going to work but the injury thing um, interestingly it's way more safer than a lot of other uh, pursuits that people uh, tackle especially like running you know running the repetitive injuries we from running yeah, yeah is the that's one of the most, uh, the worst things you can do for your body in terms of trying to get in shape and going into it quickly. Um, CrossFit is accessible to everyone because anyone can do it and everyone actually needs it. So we could pull someone in here, in here and uh, where I'm deadlifting 225 and doing rope climbs, we could have a, um, an elderly person deadlifting the PVC pipe and just grabbing the rope and moving their arms up and down. And it's I'm not elderly, but thank you for referring <laughs> to me that way. It's infinitely scalable and accessible to everyone and has a profound effect on anyone who does it. And that's the power of it. And that's, that's the beauty of it. You know, people, I hear people uh, say, well, I want to go to a CrossFit gym, I just need to get in shape first. And that's totally wrong. You need to do cross, or I'm sorry, you get in shape doing CrossFit. Just just go in, just try it, just step in and um, don't be afraid because find a gym where there's really good coaches and it's uh, they'll set you up for success. And that's the thing about the program, that's the thing about the affiliates, they, they care and they want to change people's lives and they don't want to hurt anyone. It's not in their interest to do that, best interest. And um, give it a go, give it a try. And the thing about it is it's just, it's really fun and it's, it's something different every day. And when people hear something different every day, they think it's random with no, uh, with no end state or with no goal, but there, there, there is a goal. It's to increase your work capacity across broad time and modal domains, but it's ultimately, See, to, that sometimes fast. Yeah, it's ultimately to make you fitter and to make you a better person in whatever you're looking for. So most people aren't looking for athletic dominance or, um, sporting application as like games athletes or pro athletes are most people are looking for simpler things in life like just losing a few pounds looking good in a bikini uh, being able to pick their their children up and and it'll get you all of those things with with very little um, you just got to walk through the door you just got to come in you just got to commit to to trying it out and and once you do you'll see the results it's one of those things too CrossFit's interesting in like you can't convince anyone to do it. Mm -hmm. You really shouldn't, but you can, like you can suggest, but the person has to figure it out for themselves. You can try to steer someone in this in the direction of going to the gym, but they, the best, um, the best um, salesperson for CrossFit is people like you and I. People just like not me, like you. <laughs> people see how, people see what you look like and see how fit you are, and they're like, I want that. Dave, thank you so much for this. This has been great. Um, I know, me personally, I'm really excited about the future of CrossFit, and I, I can't wait to get back into a gym. Yeah, <laughs> I can't and, wait. So We still have to wait. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I know. Possibly I know. a long time. Yeah. So people, wear your masks. It's not a political thing. Let's just put COVID to bed, for the love of God. Let's hope. You got anything else? No, I mean, that's it. Cool. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate thank your you. time. Thank you, guys. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for tuning in to the Complete Human Podcast with your hosts, Shanna Broslin and Evan DeMarco. Uh, we've been so fortunate enough to spend the last hour with Dave Castro, CEO of CrossFit. Uh, look forward to everything that CrossFit is going to be doing here in the next couple weeks, months, years, uh, as COVID goes away and as CrossFit kind of returns to uh, you know what it's going to be. So. Uh, again, can't thank Dave enough. Uh, apparently, he's going to be putting us through a workout. <laughs> um, and so Jana's going to throw up, and I'm going to cry. And uh, you'll get to see that on the video. So until next week, uh, thanks for joining us. Bye, guys.